Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a pair of fantastic guests talking about a really, really important subject with some great research, and I'm looking forward to bringing them on stage for our conversation. We've been thinking about higher education in terms of public higher education for a long time. Uh, we've been focusing on public universities and what they do and how they can help us and what they mean. We've also been looking at public attitudes, but we haven't had a session quite like this. Um, we have two different people to welcome. One of them is Professor Stephen Gavazzi, uh, who is at the Ohio State University, uh, where he is a researcher, a faculty member, and an instructor, who is also a very active uh, scholar, producing quite a few um, uh, bits of material that we should be looking at. And I just bring him on stage first so that we can see what he is up to today. Hello, Professor Gavazzi. Hey, Brian. Good to see you at Ohio State University. Thank you. Yes. So let, let me, first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. And also, um, we introduce ourselves by talking about what we're going to be doing in the future. What, what lies ahead for you for the next year? What kind of scholarship, what kind of teaching, what kind of projects are you up to? And, and what topics are top of mind for you? Two big things, uh, as you'll also hear from President Gee, the, uh, there's going to be a third book in our, uh, our efforts. The first one, of course, was back in 2018 when we did the Land Grant Universities for the Future book. The book that we're talking about today, What's Public About Public Higher Ed, also published by Johns Hopkins University Press uh, in, in 2021. And the book that we're working on with our friend Dave Rosowski from Kansas State University, we hope will be called The Great Reset. And in fact, we'll be taking into account a lot of the changes that have been occurring as a result of actually multiple pandemics that we've been experiencing over the years, not just COVID, but also the demand for racial justice, the greater divide politically uh, in terms of uh, our nation's uh, landscape politically and, and other things that have, have come about have had a tremendous impact on higher education. And we would like to share our thoughts about that. That's the climax of this book is about the Great Reset. That's right. And in fact, that's that we left it there exactly for our editor, Greg Britton, to pick up on and hopefully give us the green light for book number three. Uh, very good. Very good. Um, your uh, previous two books are very important. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, David Rosowski is also a friend and uh, does great work. So I'm really looking forward to all of you putting the band together um, and seeing what your trilogy looks like. Thank you. Yeah. The other major project that I'm working on right now is an attempt to pull uh, the 1862 land grant universities into some sort of national conversation about the debt that we owe to the tribal nations whose land, uh, oh, for yes. many of you may or may not know, has been had been taken and sold in order to fund the uh, the beginnings, the establishment of. Uh, 52 land grant universities in, in total as a, as a function of the Morrill Act. And so we're, we're really hopeful that one of the ways that 1862 land grants can begin to pay back that debt is by uh, looking at our 1994 tribal college partners and seeing whether or not we can help them uh, to, to uh, begin to achieve some of the same kinds of fortunes that the 1862 land grant universities have been able to do. So that's another big part of the work ahead wow. for me in this next year. That's a huge effort. Um, what a what a great attempt to redress a historical wrong. Bravo. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we're fortunate. We have some uh, money from USDA, from the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, to put on a conference this fall. Actually, we're going to be putting on a post-conference that will be connected to the First Americans Land Grant Consortium, known as Falcon, which is actually part of AHEC, which is the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Well, I would love I would love to follow up with that, and uh, uh, if if possible, to host a session just on that topic itself. That would be great, and uh, I think several colleagues of mine would love to join me on that. Oh, I bet, I bet, I'd be glad to you know, give as much publicity as we can. Uh, well, while we're working on this, um, and that's definitely not filler; quite the opposite. Let me, uh, and while we're, while we're working on getting um, President Key on board, let me ask, you know, 
your book is so important. And by the way, if you haven't had a chance to uh, buy the book or look at it, on the bottom left of your screen, there should be a kind of uh, orange or mustard colored button, which will take you. You click that button to a link on how to purchase the book, which I'm holding right here in my hands. Um, the, uh, the book is based on a very powerful survey that the two of you conducted. Um, going through and asking Americans what their attitudes are towards public higher education. And this is broken down by a whole variety of demographics, but also the questions you asked are very interesting. Uh, for me, one of the key questions was, if you had $100 to spend on higher education, public higher education, where would you allocate it in terms of research, in terms of teaching, and in terms of community service? And, and you had all kinds of interesting findings from that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about those findings? Well, to me, actually, this is the most uh, interesting question of all that we asked, just in terms of getting the, the answer, uh, which was across the board. Uh, folks felt that about half of that funding, $50, uh, should be put towards teaching. And also, interestingly, the remainder of that money uh, was split almost uniformly between research and community engagement. And, and the thing that was most shocking about this finding was that since we were asking about people's political affiliations, we asked that a couple of ways. So we asked it first in terms of, are you a Republican, a Democrat, an independent or other? So we tracked all uh, different aspects of the political party landscape, but we also asked people to put themselves on a continuum from, cons con from extremely conservative to middle of the road to extremely liberal. And in all cases, regardless of political stripe and regardless of where you were on the conservative liberal continuum, everybody thought the same thing. So really remarkable in an age in which we can't get Republicans and Democrats to agree on anything, that they all uniformly agreed on how public money should be spent by universities. And again, primarily on teaching and then the research and the community engagement split rather neatly. One of the things I think that's most remarkable about that is that most public universities want to brag about their research dollars expenditures. And so, you know, that really in many ways is, um, it's the equivalent of a 10 year uh, in terms of not understanding what it is that the public wants to hear from us, which is first and foremost, that we are excellent teachers. And then mm. where we are leaving off, uh, from the teaching that they want equivocally to understand not only what we're doing in terms of impactful research, but how that in fact is benefiting communities. Well, that's fascinating. I, I, one of the points of your book is that, is that public universities have to do a much better job at actually listening to the public that they serve. And it seems like the public here is saying something very, very clearly. Um, and, and this doesn't really map on to actual public university spending, right? Uh, well, yes and no. So when we're looking at the dollars that actually flow from typically from state uh, government coffers, uh, what we see is that most of the budget formulas are in fact uh, based on butts and seats, right? On uh, the amount of credit hours that are being generated. So there is some consistency in terms of how universities are actually utilizing those dollars um, where it, that falls down much more um, uh, where there's much more of a, of, a, of a misalignment is the amount of dollars that are spent on research versus the amount of dollars that are spent on community engagement that's um, Brian where I think mm. the real big mm. mismatch is because it, it's it's pennies on the dollar that universities are spending on community engagement versus what they're spending on research. That's a, that's a really, really big gap. And oh, you, found, uh, you, you found as well some, uh, some differences in terms of different people within the, uh, within the survey results, that uh, some differences by gender, some differences by political party at times, some differences by level of education. Yeah, and in fact, let's jump to, if you don't mind, another uh, finding that I thought was equally um, important, but also somewhat vexing. And it, if, it you was, can, if you can hold that for one second, sure. because I think we've just managed to land uh, President Key. Hang on, let me bring him up on stage. There I am. I don't there know why I, I wasn't on there. 
Well, it's all good now. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize. I, uh, uh, it was, Steve was doing a great job. I could hear you, but I couldn't see you. So uh, here I am. Well, well for, for some people, that would be an ideal state. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, but... For, for most people, well, most people who work with me, it's an ideal state not to be able to, to, uh, it's, uh, to it's hear me. Hey, to have you on board. Um, yeah. uh, Pre President Key, thank you so much for making the time to, uh, to meet with us. Uh, uh, Pre uh, Professor Gavazzi has been explaining uh, uh, your research. Before we get into that, I was just wondering if we could ask you to introduce yourself in terms of what you're looking forward to for the next year. Oh, well, um, you know, uh, this is my 42nd year as a university president. Which is wild. Which is wild. It really is. So uh, I started, I actually started at West Virginia University in 1980. Uh, then I made the tour, um, left here for the University of Colorado, then the Ohio State University. Steve, you got to remember to say that. And then uh, yeah, I dropped that. That's, that's, yeah. And then, that's then I then I moved to Brown, then I moved to Vanderbilt, then I moved back to Ohio State. And uh, yep. here, I am, yep. here I am again. I've, I've come, come a full circle. Uh, I think the issue, the issue that I'm looking at, uh, is is the real uh, is the post pandemic uh, dynamics of um, the fact that we yeah. understand that universities did uh, become quite agile almost immediately, uh, contrary to what we believe that we could do. Number one and number two is the fact that um, we know that change is inevitable, and the question is, and Steve and I ask this question all the time. The question is, how do we how do we capture um, how do we capture the notion of change and make it a reality within universities? Because we have no choice. I, I, I describe it this way. I think we have, we have kind of three types of institutions. We have those that will not survive. I think that uh, a lot of institutions are on life support. We have kind of the red ocean universities. Those are the ones who want to go back to the way things were. And so therefore they're all gathered around the seashore. Um, biting and scratching at each other. There's a lot of blood in the water. And then there's going to be the Blue Ocean Universities, those that don't learn to distinguish themselves, differentiate, differentiate themselves, and learn to uh, to be able to move uh, forward in a very uh, differentiated and agile way. And, those, and, and that's where I think that uh, our book is really uh, also saying, because, uh, you know, um, We've got to be we've got to become really engaged in our publics, not only as land grant universities. Our first book really was the fact that the land grant universities uh -huh. have lost their land grantness, so to speak. Uh, uh -huh. The second book is how do we how do we really engage with the publics? Because uh, in my 42 years as university president, when I became university president, 95 percent of the people thought the universities and colleges were really good. That they were great. Uh, now it's now 50 percent, and, and, and but yet at the same time, universities and colleges are more important to the economic, social, and cultural fabric of this nation than ever in its history. So, so we, we, we have lost public support at the same time that we have become more important, and that is a trend that is devastating to higher education. And that, and, that, and that really leads us to the third book called The Re Great Reset. So how do we reset all these issues? How do we recapture the importance of universities? And part of it is really what Steve was talking about, which is the engagement, the, the, the return to recognizing that we work for other people, that, uh, that, that the people of, of our states are our are, are bosses, they are our stakeholders. And the arrogance and isolations of universities have been their great downfall. And now... We are preaching in this kind of woke environment that we that we know better than the, than the general public does. Well, we may or may not, but we have to listen carefully, and we have to uh, we have to make certain that we are important. That in our heart, in the hearts and minds of the people who love and support our institutions, that we're viewed as important. If not, then we have lost the battle before we ever started. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, um, President Key, both for, for laying out that argument as well as for uh, uh, introducing yourself in this work. Uh, friends, I have, I have one more question I want to fire at our co-authors, but let me just remind you that the Future Trends Forum is for you. Uh, this is a place for you to put your questions to our guests. Uh, so if you have any comments that you'd like to make, if you have read the book and you would like to draw attention to a particular chapter or finding, or if any of these any of our discussion has raised thoughts for you, please either click the raised hand button so you can join us on stage. Um, and you may or may not be wearing a bow tie. Um, I could be wearing a bow tie and no one could tell. 
Um, or if you want to just type in your question or comment, please feel free to. The forum is open for you. Um, the question I, I would like to just uh, put to the two of you, if, if I could, is the, well, a major problem that you articulate so well and so passionately through the book is that higher education, public higher education, doesn't listen very closely to its communities, uh, that we're good at pushing stuff out. Uh, you have a really nice section on, on extension programs, for example. Uh, we are good at going to the legislature. We are good at publishing content, but we're not very good at listening. Um, in terms of your of the great reset you hope for, how can colleges and universities actually listen better to their publics? Dave? I'll, I'll, I'll tee it up and then you can uh, drive it home. So one of the things that has happened since uh, President Gee and I wrote this book is that I've become the director of CHRR, which is the Center for Human Resources Research here at Ohio State. And it is in many ways our center on data and survey excellence. And so one of the things that uh, we've done over the past 50 years, we've been in existence since 1965, primarily doing work for the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, mm. on uh, a set of studies that are mostly known as the National Longitudinal Studies. Um, we, we've done that we've done that so well that uh, we've decided to begin to branch out and look at other uh, other ways that we can tap into state and regional concerns. So we've developed something called the American Population Panel, which Gordon and I used in our book, uh, which was meant to be a go-to panel where we could ask about the questions of the day. And in fact, what, what Gordon and I found was that uh, this was the very first time that anyone had ever approached the American Population Panel, uh, and to our knowledge, any other panel that's out there to ask such explicit questions about higher education. It's my belief that every university should be doing that, that we should be in regular contact with uh, our stakeholders and that we should be not only asking our, our stake, stakeholders that we know are our cheerleaders, but also uh, the ones who might be our biggest critics and opening the door to conversations about the kinds of things that they like and do not like about what we are doing as a public university. Because again, as Gordon himself said, uh, the, the public are our, they're our bosses. And, and yet I think that we, we oftentimes uh, not only turn a deaf ear, but in many respects, actually almost go out of our way to make sure that we don't ask questions that we may not want the answers to. So I, I really think that a big part of what the public universities of the future need to do is they need to be front loading the kinds of surveying that we uh, had promoted in the book. And I think that they mm -hmm. need to find ways to be able to show the communities that we serve that not only are we willing to ask those questions, but we're also willing to act on the answers that we're given. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, President Gould, do you want to... Gordon, you did something like this, right? Because I prompted you. I said, what's West Virginia doing in this? Yeah, place? no, I, I have taken you knew I was getting, you, you knew you were going to get that. So when, when I came, when I came back, I did a survey to to get a sense of, of the public's perception of the university. Um, and then we worked like crazy to uh, to influence that in positive ways, becoming really inextricably intertwined in the life of the institution. Brought McKinsey in to talk about how does the university change itself in order to become the economic engine of the state. Uh, I yeah. go to every county in the state every year and, and hold forums. Uh, I get our faculty on the road at what we call a country roads tour to get them outside the box. And, uh, yeah. and we yeah. have bought 23 hospitals uh, become the, the health provider of the state uh, and we now can, can impact about 80 to 85 percent of health wise of the population the state build new hospitals children's hospitals so no one has to leave and then then have uh, then created a uh, then created a, a a remote worker program to get bright young people to come and and populate uh, West Virginia and then uh, focusing on our assets among those are the fact that we have the, some of the finest outdoor recreation facilities in the country, if not in the world, and we're in the Eastern time zone. So uh, all of that, we then we did a survey two years later and, uh, and uh, uh, about 90% of the people in the state uh, said that we were either critical 
uh, or very important to the to the future of their lives and that of the university. It was much lower than that, or that of the state. It was much lower than that uh, eight years ago. So you can impact the you can impact the public's perception, but but it, it is not impacting. It's not by marketing. It's actually by doing. It's actually by 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 getting involved in the in the life and livelihood and culture and in understanding the state. And it's also it's also um, making certain that you listen carefully and that you have humility about that. Which is vital. Which is vital. Uh, thank you both. That's a that's a really solid answer. And uh, I, I, I personally it'd be great to see uh, much more of that in other states as well. Uh, friends, while you're thinking of questions, um, please just remember to uh, that we're all very friendly. We won't bite. And uh, even though there may be a terrifying animal behind President Key, I'm sure he'll be uh, he'll be very very kind to you. Um, the uh, uh, one of the one of the findings that uh, that impressed me a great deal um, was the uh, sense about international higher education uh, that you were expecting that when polling people that that they would tend to see. Uh, a they tend to express a desire for public universities to focus on their state or a sub-state region. But instead, you found a lot more appetite for universities to serve the world um, and to be a kind of global presence. Uh, can you speak to that a bit? Because uh, that seemed to surprise you too as well. Um, what can we learn from that finding? Greg, right, Gordon, take this first. You have your expert, William Brustein, on staff. Yes, well, you know, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, first of all, we face a demographic cliff. Uh, I think that there's that reality. And, uh, and uh, secondly of all, we face the responsibility of making sure that our students uh, understand that the world is very small and that we have to expose, expose ideas from a variety of cultures and a variety of, uh, and a variety of areas to, to our institution. Third, it's a learning and it's it's a living learning experience, and um, so I think that uh, for us, uh, I, I, first of all, let me just step back. I think that I think that uh, the the notion of building campuses in foreign lands is is uh, probably not a wise thing to do. I think it is a, a bit jingoistic. Uh, I think it is. We 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 know what we know what you need, and I'm not certain that that's what we wanted to do. I think that the best thing to do is to create uh, very strategic affiliations with institutions that that are uh, that fill your gaps or like-minded that uh, you can work with for us because we're uh, we're in a small state um, and uh, you know we're taking a look at uh, affiliations with areas where we've always had strength you know we we have we have educated a vast number of the petroleum engineers for aramco so we need to be in the um, middle east uh, Yes. And uh, and we, you know, we have a broad base of uh, interest in in India. We picked out a country in the, in the southern hemisphere, Paraguay, because we happen to have an area of real interest there. I mean, who else who else is going to Paraguay but me? You know, and that, that's the whole point. The whole point is that is that again, it's 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 finding your niche and differentiating yourself, and then. And then, obviously, with the demographic cliff, uh, uh, international students are going to be ways for us to um, make certain that we continue to have uh, a viable and uh, creative population. Yeah, what, I, what I would add to that, too, just to keep in mind, is uh, although there was, in fact, uh, that surprise in terms of a slight majority being interested more in international affairs than uh, impact that was closer to home, we have to remember there were some huge, significant differences uh, such that I'll just paraphrase the older uh, that you were, the more that you uh, had better education, higher level of education, the whiter uh, that you were. These are all indications that there is, a, in fact, another kind of divide here uh, that that splits along education that splits along age, that splits to some extent on race and ethnicity, uh, because people who are, were younger, who were uh, more likely to be um, people of color uh, and people who had higher education levels, all were the ones that were driving the findings about there being a, a majority of folks interested in, more interested 
in international affairs. So we do need to keep that in mind. So again, the, the, the trap that I would not want to see public universities falling into is saying, oh, well, that gives us license to just talk about our global footprint and not recognize that there are many people, may not be a, a, a majority, but many people still would be expecting closer to home impact. So, you know, we shouldn't get too, too carried away with a slight majority saying that they were perhaps a little more interested in international. Well, thank you. That's that's quite a, a quite a balance, quite a straddle uh, for for people to attempt. Um, thank you. Uh, th like I said, friends, if you haven't read the book, the the book is extremely clear and based on this on this uh, on this survey. Uh, we have questions that have come in. And I'd like to begin with uh, one uh, from Abbas, uh, and Abbas asks this. Given that public higher education relies heavily on state funding, in states with Republican governors, public institutions have had to follow the political directives rather than public health guidance, e.g. vaccines. How do you make sense of this? Well, I, I think that, I think that uh, um, what you do as a university and what we did is we, we, we started off in the very beginning, we did not require um, uh, we did not require vaccinations, uh, but what we did is we had pop-ups, we, we cajoled, we talked about it, we developed an educational process. I, I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, one of the mistakes some institutions made is the fact that they immediately jumped to, uh, they immediately jumped to uh, requiring or mandating. And as you know, uh, mandates uh, 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 often backfire, and I think it backfired on a number of institutions. One of the reasons we have uh, some of these states uh, making these, these particular rules is the fact that universities led by, by panicking. And I think that, I think that uh, uh, what we do is we, is we cause our own problems and then we blame it on other people. We need to be smart about how we lead as institutions. And, uh, and yeah, uh, not everyone, not everyone uh, uh, in certain parts of the country wanted to be vaccinated. But guess what? Be educated. If they don't want to be, um, uh, then um, what you do is you make certain that 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 the uh, the vaccine or whatever it is is available uh, to those who want to have it, and uh, then you do a great educational. Uh, form for people to get them to understand why it's, why it's wise for them to do it. Yeah, I, I don't want to make I don't want to make this out to only be about vaccinations. Um, I think this is a larger issue that you're um, that, that, that that's embedded inside of that question. But I, I will point out that Ohio State uh, University exists in the state of Ohio, which does have a Republican administration, and we did require vaccines. So uh, I actually don't think it splits neatly around uh, red and blue governorships. I think that this splits more around how well the president of a given university and that administration has a prior track record of working together. And actually, this is uh, I think that Christina Johnson's job here at Ohio State and Michael Drake's before that, um, who was uh, the successor to Gordon Gee, owed a great debt of obligation to Gordon Gee because of the relationships that he had established with the then governor, John Kasich. And I think that actually for many years, Ohio State was the envy of the rest of the nation precisely because there was such a strong relationship built between the universities, again, led by the flagship university, Ohio State, but it was also because Gordon was bringing in the other presidents uh, of the other universities and in fact was also working with the community colleges at the same time to create an open dialogue that I think made things very different when it came to the pandemic here in Ohio uh, than, than in, in some blue led states uh, where I think there was actually more consternation and more conflict about what was supposed to happen. Gordon, would you agree with that? Uh, well, I think that it is important for the university to to work very closely with the legislature. You know, what I what I what I know is that uh, when when our legislative friends, our colleagues, get to know us, they 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 learn a lot about what we're doing. But but it requires us to be very transparent, but also to make certain that we don't do stupid things. 
um, you, you know, uh, uh, universities are housed with very smart people who do stupid things. And uh, I think that that's one of the uh, one of the lessons that I've always learned over 42 years is the fact that we tend to uh, we tend to always believe that we have the answer when we when the answer is that we ought to listen and then determine how we best proceed. Uh, I see. Uh, Abbas, thank you for that question. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I'm really glad. If you want to follow up, please, uh, please do. And, and thank you both for that, those very practical, thoughtful, and experience-based responses. Um, Stephen, were you thinking of Michigan? No, don't answer that. Don't answer that. I'm not going to say that. Um, I, I, I have, I have. I was, reasons. I was. No, just kidding. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always willing to tease people from Ohio about this. But, but we have question, more questions coming in. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to fire them off. And this is a, a very, very practical one from uh, Lee Nichols. Um, who uh, who asks, it seems to me that many faculty and leadership at a university are not from the physical region of a university, but many staff are. How does that relate to universities listening to their public? Um, well, that is a great question. I think it requires, uh, you know, th th that's true. For, first of all, you know, I'm not a native West Virginian. I'm a native of Utah. And I've been here long enough that I get to understand mm. the mm. place of both both in Ohio and West Virginia, I really work very hard to understand the culture of the place. I think uh, uh, culture is the driving force and should be the driving force of positive, constructive culture within a university. But if you come in and, and try, to, uh, try to develop a culture that is the one that you like, rather than the one that mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is embedded in your communities, you make a, you make a huge mistake. Secondly of all, you need to listen to your staff. I mean, we and to our students. You know, um, it's uh, uh, there. There are three elements to a university: faculty, staff, and students. When you think about it that, that way, and uh, for for too long, for too long, we think that there's a pecking order: faculty, then 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 students, and maybe then staff. I think that that is wrong. Right. I think that we, uh, I think our culture should require that we are all. Um, children of the university and that we all need to uh, listen carefully to each other and learn from each other. I, I learn a great deal from our staff. I meet with them every month and uh, uh, with our staff council and I, and uh, they really do give me an insight into what our staff and what our communities are thinking. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a I, terrific. I'll, I'll echo that. I think that um, this is probably, this is a great question, by the way. And I think this is probably one of those places where there's some low hanging fruit for, mm -hmm. I think, especially university leaders to understand that there may be resources and assets, especially from an informational capacity that staff have that administrators and faculty and students should be listening to. Um, I think that there is also an interesting split between students who are from the area and students who are coming in from outside of the area. And I think there's something there uh, that I learned when I was the dean and director of a regional campus, which was to, to not make the mistake of thinking that my student body was the same. That there were, I think, huge differences between people who were within a 20 mile radius of our campus and had historically been coming to the regional campus at Ohio State Mansfield versus those that increasingly were coming from outside that circle, were coming from the Cleveland area, coming from the Akron area. Uh, they had a very different viewpoint of the campus. And I think that those different viewpoints had to be respected, but they had to be differentiated. And so I actually had separate student groups that I listened to in terms of those who were from the local area versus those who were coming from further away. So I, I think that that's critical. And, and so I think in the same way, thinking of staff in the same in that same way, um, staff who are indigenous to the area uh, are going to have, I think, a greater appreciation for the local feel uh, uh -huh. than anyone uh -huh. is going to have coming from from much farther away. Uh, that's excellent. That's, thank you both for those great answers. Uh, Lee, what a terrific question. Um, and uh, I love how you both ran in, in two complimentary directions with that. Uh, well, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's a text question uh, from, you know, you can type into the Q&A box. Now let me bring up someone with a video question. 
Uh, this is our friend Charles Finlay from Northeastern University. Uh, and let's see if his video is on. Hello, Charles. Oh, hello, hello. See if I can uh, press this on here and get it all done. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You, you look a little cloudy right now, but there you are. All okay. Right. Yeah. The yeah. question that came up in my mind was following up on the vaccine issue. And uh, you had mentioned that you had made your own decisions about that, but there are other states where certain political leaders have limited the free speech in the classroom and uh, limited discussion of certain issues of grounding race, uh, GLBT issues, and other controversial topics that might offend the uh, learner in some way. And I'm just wondering how public universities respond to those challenges as an edict. Well, I tell you exactly how I respond. I okay. I think that universities are places of free speech, period. Um, I think good ideas, bad ideas. I think uh, controversial ideas. I think irritating ideas. I think uh, ideas that may not uh, feel very strongly. I think that, I, I think again, that there is this action and reaction. Universities, uh, if, if, in order for us to have free speech uh, as designated by our, by our, um, by our um, legislatures, we've got to allow free speech on our campuses. And the truth of the matter is, is that we have, uh, with the with the cancellation, with the with the fact that we don't invite a lot of people onto our campuses, the fact that we don't truly have uh, a robust uh, conversation in the marketplace, um, we've brought this on ourselves, and so we need to we need to deal with it very clearly. And so, as a public university president, my my view is that anyone can come on my campus and say any damn thing they want to, and I'm going to support them being able to. I may not agree with it, but I believe that that is very important. And the minute that we, the minute that you uh, that you have people canceling, the minute you have people not not invited, the minute you have people um, saying that, uh, gee, you know, this person offends me, then that's the minute we lose being a university and we become a political entity. Yeah, I think it cuts both ways. I think that's the thing that we need to be uh, really acknowledging here, which is that uh, if if we're going to allow the left to speak, but not the right or vice versa, if uh, in more conservative areas or more conservative institutions, they're letting the right speak and not the left speak, that's where you run into the problems. Gordon and I have written about this actually in several different places that universities need to be running to the middle. And we have to be the marketplace of ideas. And, and we really have to be adopting the mantra that, that Gordon talked about here, which is, you know, let the speech happen and then let people make their minds up about whether or not it's a stupid idea. And I think that our, the history of our country has been we allow that to happen. And I think the more that we move universities away from that role, the more dangerous it's going to get for those universities because they will begin to have control exerted from the outside. I do think that if universities were seen, uh, again, as a marketplace of ideas where they were agnostic, they were neither left nor right, I think it would take care of 99% of what we're seeing right now in terms of these legislative efforts uh, to push things forward. Now, that, now saying that, we also exist in a, in a climate where there are a lot of culture wars going on. People are trying to score points politically. We see certain governors who think that they are probably going to be the next uh, uh, a candidate for either the left or the right. And so they're positioning themselves by, by creating legislation that um, it is what it is. We, 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 know, we, we, know, we, we know it when we see it. Um, and, but I, I honestly think that that's still the minority. Uh, I, I think that universities have been given great room uh, for move, movement towards the middle, and I think we need to continue to see that happening, or we're going to get more of what you've mentioned. We're going to get more more legislative actions, which, which don't make sense unless you understand the larger context. Okay. Thank you for your response. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, yeah. Charles, and, and Google. Um, so if you're, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So um, please raise your hand if you want to follow Charles and ask uh, more questions. 
Uh, gentlemen, we have uh, still more text questions coming up, and so I want to share one of these from our, our longtime friend, Kiel Dunsch. And uh, Kiel asks, many students attend college because degrees are required by employers. Shorter, cheaper alternative credentials are threatening this business model. I would like Gordon and Stevens' view on this. What do you um, think? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I'm a great believer in, uh, first of all, I believe the community college is in many ways the building block of higher education. I think that, uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, you know, um, what we've done is we've, we've made, a, made a pecking order in higher education, which I think is unfortunate. Um, I, I, view, I view education as pre-K through life. Yeah. And that uh, the one thing we need to do is we need to encourage everyone to get uh, to continue their education. Not everyone is going to want to come to university. Not everyone is going to want to uh, uh, study Byzantine uh, Byzantine cultures, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, but but we know that everyone needs in a very fast forward world needs to have an education. I believe that one of the important things is the stackable credentials, and universities need to uh, be much more confluent. With with accepting and and working closely with the stack of credentials, someone someone comes out of the navy, uh, who's had uh, uh, four, six, eight years of training in in a certain area. We ought to certify those. Uh, we ought to create uh, ways for 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 people to bypass the uh, English 101 and do some other kinds of things. And at the same time, we need to recognize the value of of, of the community college and its. Uh, and, and what it does, and the and the technical schools and others, because they they are they're enormously value added to the to the life of the you know, uh, to, to the life of our culture, and of our educational stability. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Steve? so you know, it, it you can you can quickly generate a really heated conversation by making the following statement: Not everybody needs to go to college. And, and what I would add to that, to make that true, at least in my heart, in my mind, is the way colleges are, and universities are currently structured, not everybody needs to go to college. And hmm. so I, I think that one of the criticisms, one of the major criticisms that I have of higher education right now is that they have failed to move out of an increasingly archaic model where they believe that education for education's sake is everything as opposed to getting back to really what are the land grant roots of a practical education where you can begin to provide people with opportunities to immediately apply the learnings, the teachings uh, that they're, they're getting. And, and in that respect, we have fallen woefully short, except in the professional fields. So I think we see this in engineering. I think we see this in licensed uh, degrees like social work. Um, but we don't see this in many, many other areas. And I think that that's really unfortunate because I think it's possible. We just don't spend the time. We don't spend the energy thinking about how to make that uh, practical in a 21st century environment. And, and we're going to create a, a we're going to create competition for ourselves. I was at the I was on the campus of the University of Cincinnati yesterday, uh, one of the homes of the Co-op Systems and Engineering. Our friend Charles was just oh. uh, at North uh, at Northeastern. You know what what they've figured out is the fact that businesses want to have relationships, immediate relationships, and our students want to have that also. These cooperative programs, these these applied uh, programs, I think are very very important. I when I was at Brown, I. I I tell the story, and, and, and it's not meant to be negative, but there is a negative aspect to it, and that is that uh, that uh, we went through a process of determining uh, who would be members of the AAU, and I would happen to be the the chairman of the AAU, AAU at that time, and and it became very readily apparent that, uh, and I call the AAU the College of Cardinals. I do that with affection, but uh, yeah. but uh, 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 their whole thing was certain they define research in a very limited way. And for those land grant universities, uh -huh. uh, for the University of Nebraska, Iowa State has just quit the AAU because they realize that, that the AAU does not uh, really recognize the value of applied and agricultural research, which by the way, feeds the world. Uh -huh. And uh, so yes. I think that, I, I think that uh, we, we need to start redefining the value of the educational uh, uh, programs based upon 
a, a real applied approach that I think is much more conducive to the world in which we find ourselves now. Well, in, in your book, which manages to cover a lot of ground, you, you talk about this this pendulum in American educational history between you know, research and teaching that's more theoretically oriented versus that's more practically oriented. Uh, you mentioned the Grange movement, for example, which pushed and pulled on this. Um, th thank you. This is this, this is a, a terrific answer. We we have another giant question for you. Um, it's one that comes. I'm not sure we can handle them anymore. You've about exhausted us. Just kidding. Oh, I don't imagine that for a second. Uh, our, our good friend from California, George Station, asks, how might our guests' work evolve in the light of recent Supreme Court decisions and their impact on the shape of funding the public university? Now, now George picks out a few, and he says, please address whichever of these you'd like. The, uh, the end of uh, Roe versus Wade, the EPA decision that came out this morning, uh, and the decision changing the historic relationship between U.S. courts and Native American tribes. So he says, and or all of the above as appropriate, please. Well, I'll, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer by training. I actually spent some time uh, at, the, uh, at the United States Supreme Court, so I can I could speak uh, to that a little uh, bit. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, everything, everything is a pendulum. We talk about this uh, in our own book. Um, for example, uh, the, the headline screaming across the, the front pages of the major newspapers is that the United States Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States did away with abortion. They did not. They, they sent it back to the states where it had been for 150 years. You know, we've got to be very, we've got to be very clear about these conversations. Uh, the EPA issue was a West Virginia issue where, I, where I'm sitting right now. That, that, uh -huh. that was uh, West Virginia versus the EPA. Well, uh, the truth of the matter is, is we have, uh, we, we have, when, when you over-regulate, you have over, we, you have over responses. And I think that that is, that is always the issue with the courts. The courts have to be the great uh, um, modifier here. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have tried to politicize the courts. I think that that, I think that that is 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 going to inure to our uh, detriment. So, I think, first of all, with any with any court decision, you have to listen carefully. You have to read it carefully. I I read the I read the opinion very carefully. Um, uh, you know, uh, Justice Thomas made a, had a throwaway line, and people latched right onto that that we're going to do mm -hmm. away with with all of the uh, other rights have been granted. It just simply was not the case, and so let's. Let, uh, let's be let's be teachers as university leaders let's teach people to, to listen carefully and to read carefully and not to um, you not know not to uh, gain uh, congratulations by jumping to conclusions and immediately getting off the reservations now all of these have implications and they're very serious implications as to how I feel personally um, I have I have personal views on all of them but but right now, as a university leader, I want to make certain that we have, we have, we take all of these as educational teaching moments, and then learn how we deal with them on our campus. Wow, wow. So, well, I appreciate your perspective both as the as the lawyer. Um, so I have to call you Counselor Gee from now on. Um, but also, <laughs> right. But also, in, in terms of turning this into pedagogy, um, thank you, thank you, uh, Stephen. Did you want to jump on that as well? Yeah, so I, I think this is another way of getting back to the point I made earlier, which is that universities run need to run to the middle on all of this. Uh, if we are seen as somehow uh, lamenting what the Supreme Court has done without allowing for uh, the, uh, the side that says this was a great thing uh, on any of these um, actions, I think we're going to put ourselves again in increased danger of seeing being seen as being one-sided as opposed to being a, yes. a, a generator of the marketplace of ideas. And so that I think more generally, um, I would say that that's that's the case. The other thing I would want to point out is that in some ways, at least some of those Supreme Court actions that George had uh, mentioned. Uh, there's a reality to this, which is the Supreme Court is pushing things back to the states. And one of the beautiful things about the land grant system itself 
was that we never made it a system that looked the, that looked the same across all 50 states. And so that's very different than what happened in Germany. That's very different than the Japanese model, for instance, yeah. yes. uh, where there's great uniformity across institutions. Mm -hmm. What we have the ability to do, I think, as public and land grant universities is to shape that pedagogy that Gordon talked about, to shape the scholarship that's going to come out of this, that will be tailored to the needs of each of the states that these public universities find themselves in. And so I think that there's there's actually there's 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 a, a silver lining in a lot of this in terms of what it's going to force states to do. And I think that universities can help lead the way in a dialogue about what's going to happen between the public and the and the governance of that particular state. The only thing that I'll say a little bit different, and it gets back to some of the uh, uh, filler I was trying to add at the at the beginning, Brian, which was about the uh, Native American issue. I do think that there's something very different that universities are going to have to come to grips with, with regards to Native American issues and the debt that's owed to them. And I think what has happened is the Supreme Court has pushed that back to a state level too and said, uh -huh. in essence, although there are many federal actions that have taken place historically, this is now up to states to remedy. Now, in this case, the Supreme Court um, ruling was about, crim was about criminal activity and who could pros prosecute. So it's a very limited case of, of, uh, of native sovereignty and tribal sovereignty. But nevertheless, again, I think that there's a reality in front of us that universities are going to have to come to grip with their own lack of relationship between uh, their institutions of higher learning and, and tribal nations before they can really get to a place where they can say that there's something they can do for the states themselves, because they've got to clean their own house before they're really going to be able to comment on other things. It, it hadn't occurred to me, but it sounds like you're the between the two of you that and you're 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 supporting a kind of federal approach um, in the sense of of uh, the U.S. as a federation uh, where states have more and more uh, determination over public higher education and less so the federal government. Well, they, they always have. They always have. Yes. Uh, the, the only yes. the only control the Fed has had uh, over us until recently has, has been through. Uh, through uh, funding models, through Pell Grants and a variety of other things. But, but yeah. the federalization of higher education is not in the best interest of higher education, I can, I can tell you. You know, and it's, uh, there, there's so many of those issues. It's, it's like the rules on Title IX and mm -hmm. a variety of other things. I mean, you know, uh, universities get really caught in the middle on this. Uh, one administration makes some rules. The next administration makes other rules. What we need to do is, as universities, we need to come up with fair standards about how we do some of these things, and 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 uh, the regulatory the regulatory folks need to need to back away from this. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the people in the Department of Education um, in Washington have really never had an opportunity to run. Uh, university or a college uh, oh, uh, i think that we ought to require all of them to have that opportunity before they can uh, start telling us how to do things same same thing with our legislature and others you know i think that these are unique institutions powerful important the most important thing that we do in this country is to educate our citizens and and right now uh what we're doing is we're we're fighting too many battles and not getting to the education issue. Uh, unfortunately, it is three o'clock and I have another I event that I have to go to. So. I, I understand completely. Uh, and we are out of time ourselves. Can I just uh, ask both of you, what's the best way to keep up with uh, the two of you um, and to find out what you're up to besides, uh, uh, besides the Johns Hopkins University Press catalog, besides that? So we have that brand new article that just came out, Brian. I think you posted it on the website um, yep. that came out in uh, State and Local Government Review. Gordon and I have a number of other articles and op-ed pieces that are in the works. So I think just following us on Twitter uh, and staying in touch. For those of you who are interested in the native stuff, there is something called Land Grant Truth. Land Grant Truth is a blog website if you're interested in reading more about that. Um, but we also hope to be okay. getting out some pieces uh, between Gordon, David, and myself uh, on the Great Reset as well. So in some ways, some teasers uh, before we actually have the next book come out. And well, then we'll I'm, figure I'm, out what I'm we're going to do forward. after that. Well, thank you both for spending an thank hour. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, this has been great.
Yeah. Thanks, thanks very have, much for this. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye bye, President Key. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, but don't go away, friends. Uh, let me just point to uh, where we're headed next. And let me thank you all for the great questions uh, that you've been given today. Uh, if you're interested in continuing to talk about this, everything from the connection between land grant universities and Native Americans to the politics of public higher education, please you know, just use the uh, hashtag FTTE on Twitter or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Chindig Events, or check out my blog, brianalexander.org, for more conversations about this. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including on public universities, go look at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can find our recordings there going back six years. If you'd like to look ahead a bit to our upcoming sessions, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can see more and more of our sessions. And if you'd like to share some of your own work, be it with public universities or otherwise, please just shoot me a note so that I can share it with everybody. Uh, thank you all for spending a great hour with us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Uh, it's summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, which means we're super hot. So for those of you in the North, please stay cool as you can. For those of you in the South, be as warm as is appropriate. Above all, everybody, take care and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.